This is a so-called star shower, a laser and it's sending the laser light in every which way, all kinds of different directions. It's basically sending out a whole bunch of rays of light and all of the rays of light emanate from this one point here, but they're going in all different directions. And then what you see is that they land on all these different places on the far wall. I want to use that to illustrate the inverse square law. So the inverse square law occurs over and over again in physics. And the reason it occurs over and over again is because it's basically geometrical. Basically, it's reflecting the fact that the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So if you don't worry about the 4 pi part, just worry about how it varies with distance. As you make a bigger and bigger and bigger sphere, the area of that sphere is proportional to the square of the radius. Okay, so you see the star shower. See, I'm standing really close, and you can see the dots are close together. And if I get farther and farther away, you'll see the dots on my shirt get farther and farther apart. And that kind of makes sense because the dots have a constant angular distance between them. And over a larger radius, that angular distance turns into a bigger spatial distance. So you see the rays get closer and closer and closer together as I get closer and closer and closer to the source. Here is a nice University of Pennsylvania poster. If I show it to you this way, it's basically a one meter by one meter square of white material. Here I am only about a meter away from the star shower. Here I am about two meters away from the star shower. Here I am about four meters away from the star shower. And you can see as I get farther and farther and farther away, I intercept a smaller and smaller and smaller fraction of the dots. This star shower doesn't actually cover, you know, it doesn't cover all directions on the globe. It only points out in a cone. But imagine a star shower that pointed out in all the directions of the globe. If I go one meter away, then, okay, and this is my one square meter. My one square meter is divided by four pi r squared. R is one meter. So all those rays cover a total surface area of four pi times one meter squared, a distance of one meter. If I go two meters away, all those rays cover a surface area of 4 pi times 2 meters, the quantity squared. So that's like one quarter as many rays per meter. If I go to like 3 meters away, you see now it's like 4 pi times 3 meters, the quantity squared. So that's like one ninth as many rays intersect my one square meter thing. Or if I go to like 4 units away, then it should be like 1 16th of the original number of rays intersecting. Or if I go to like five meters away, it should be like 1 25th of the original number of rays. Or if I go to like six meters away, it should be like 1 36th of the original number of rays, and so on. You say, why is this relevant to sound? Well, if I have a source of sound, like suppose I have a lawnmower running in an open field. If you're right next to the lawnmower, then in your ear, you, you intercept a large fraction of the acoustic energy emitted by that lawnmower. The farther and farther and farther away you go from the lawnmower, the smaller the fraction of the sound energy emitted by that lawnmower is intercepted by your ear. So if you say, how loud does something sound? First of all, there's power. Power is like the energy per unit time. So there's like the acoustical energy per unit time emitted by the lawnmower. But then how much of it does your ear actually intercept? And that is like power per unit area because your ear only picks up some little area of sound waves. Just like when I put this sheet of paper, this sheet of paper picks up, say, some constant area. But as I back away from the light source, this constant area picks up a smaller and smaller and smaller fraction of the total light emitted by the star shower. So similarly, as I back farther and farther and farther away from that lawnmower, my ear intercepts a smaller and smaller and smaller fraction of the acoustical energy, or energy per unit time, emitted by that lawnmower. The sound intensity that I hear is the energy per unit time emitted by that lawnmower in acoustic form divided by 4 pi r squared, where r is how far away I am. If I get twice as far away from the lawnmower, then the intensity, that's the power per unit area that my ear 
year detects is one quarter as much. If I get three times as far away, it's one ninth as much. Four times away, as far away, it's one sixteenth as much, and so on. Ten times as far away, it's one one hundredth as much acoustical intensity as power per unit area. What I just did to the transverse wave machine here, first of all, I left the dash pod at the far end, so it's supposed to absorb as much of the energy as it can of whatever makes it to that end. I think that just makes the picture a little easier to see. And then in the middle of the machine, I put a 100 gram mass. And I had to put a balanced pair because this thing is balanced, so I don't want to make it lopsided. So I put a pair of 100 gram masses about halfway down the machine. So I'm gonna send a little pulse down and what I want you to imagine, now these are transverse waves on the transverse wave machine. You know that sound waves traveling through air are longitudinal waves, so they're like that when they propagate that way, like this, rather than going like this. But again, waves are a lot easier to see on the transverse wave machine. I want you to kind of imagine this is what happens when I'm speaking and there's a thin wall. Maybe it's just like a thin layer of plaster or a thin layer of dry drywall, gypsum, wall boards, or you know, maybe very thin plywood. And then I think we're going to see that some of the wave gets through to the adjacent room, let's say. Like let's say this is my room and this is my suite mate's room. Maybe there are two adjacent offices in an office building, maybe two adjacent classrooms. If I talk at a wall or a closed window, you know now from our experience with indoor spaces that when a sound wave reaches the edge of a room, it's reflected. The picture is a little more complicated than that in that not all of the wave is reflected. Some of the wave is transmitted through to the other side and some of it is reflected back into the same side. And then there's even more to the story because some of it can be absorbed and dissipated into thermal energy. In this case, there's dissipation into thermal energy at the, at the far end there. But what I want you to focus on here is that some of the incident wave is reflected back to me and some of it is transmitted into the next door space. I'll send a pulse down and we should see part of it transmitted through and part of it reflected. Yeah, I think that's pretty decent. The transmitted and reflected waves are pretty similar in magnitude. I didn't really plan it that way, but it seems to work out that way. That's for a pulse I send from one end to the other. Let me try the harmonic wave, so a wave of constant frequency. And you can see at very high frequency, the mass is pretty effective at stopping the wave from getting through from one side to the other. And that's generally true if you have a, um, a, a wall, even a relatively thin wall from between one room and another then the high frequencies will be mostly reflected. But then let me send a, let me send a lower frequency through. Okay, you see, so for the lower frequency, uh, a larger fraction of the wave gets through to the other side. Still kind of looks like what's on the far side is smaller than what's on the near side but definitely some decent fraction of it gets through. And I guess if I try to go to even lower frequency, then I think this mass won't be very effective at all at blocking the wave. So this is kind of, this is true of sound waves going through a wall or a closed window. But it, I think it's nicely illustrated on the wave machine with the mass in the middle that At higher frequency, the mass is more effective at stopping the sound wave or the wave from getting through from one side to the other. And at lower frequency, the mass is much less effective at reflecting the wave, keeping it in the source room, keeping it from getting through into the, uh, the adjacent room. Now, I want to try the same thing, same thing with a bigger mass. So I just multiplied by about a factor of five the mass in the middle of the wave machine. Let's see what happens if I send a pulse down now. So now I think the transmitted pulse is a lot smaller than the incident pulse. Let me see. 
Yeah, I think the larger fraction of it is reflected now. So that's like using a thicker wall. Well, an imperial unit is like using half inch or five eighths inch drywall rather than just like say quarter inch or three eighths inch drywall. Or it's like using a, a masonry wall instead of just a thin wood wall. I'll do another pull pulse. Okay, and then let me try the same thing with uh, a wave of constant frequency. Let's see what happens. So here's high frequency again. So it seems like really very little gets through at high frequency. And then let me try a uh, somewhat lower frequency. Yeah, I'd say even at this frequency, very little gets through. You can see something gets through, but it's really pretty small in amplitude. That's pretty decent. Yeah, so you can see that basically you see some kind of activity of that same frequency on the far side, but it's a lot smaller than what you see on the near side. Yeah, so you see it's less effective at lower frequency, but the larger the mass, the more effective. So more mass, or in case of a wall, it's mass per unit area. But in case of this wave machine, it's just the amount of mass I put in the middle of the machine. So if you make your wall more massive, more mass per unit area of the wall material, then it's more effective at reflecting the sound, keeping it on the same side, not letting as much of it get to the far side. And as you go up in frequency, it's much easier to keep the noise, the sound, on your side of the wall, keep it from getting through to the adjacent room. And as you go down in frequency to lower and lower frequency, it's much harder to contain the noise. So if you had a, like a bass drum, boom, 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 then even if you have a pretty good wall between you and your, uh, your suite mate's room, it's pretty hard to keep that from getting through to the other side. Whereas like, uh, you know, if you're playing the piccolo or some kind of high frequency noise or the high frequency noise of an old fashioned computer monitor, then that's actually pretty easy to block. It uh, is blocked pretty effectively by mass in the middle. Okay, so the next thing I want to show you is the trick that really works well when you're building a room, which is instead of putting a huge amount of mass in one place, you can split up the mass and make a double layer of wall. So instead of one big massive wall, you have two layers of wall separated by empty space. And that actually makes a really good sound barrier. Okay, so now I have just about the same amount of mass we're using before, but the mass is divided up. So half of the mass is here and half of the mass is here. This is like a double layer soundproof wall. This is the way in real life you make a nice wall that keeps noise on one side from getting through to the other side. So let me send a pulse down here. And yeah, I think actually I'll send this pulse through. And actually, so pulse has many frequency components, Fourier components, you don't have to know this, but you can see the long wavelength part, you see? So what gets through to the other side is actually just the longest wavelength or lowest frequency part. Let me do a sinusoidal wave here again. And look at this, I think like basically nothing gets through the other side at high frequency. That's, that's very effective. Let me try, let me let this die out a little bit. And I'll try a somewhat lower frequency. And again, it seems like basically uh, nothing gets through. It's, it's actually really good. Let me try an even a little bit lower frequency. Eventually when we get down low enough, you'll see something gets through, but yeah, okay, if we get down low enough, then even with this trick, something gets through. But this is pretty darn good. So when you split up the mass into two separated blobs of mass, so here's one wall, and then there's a gap, and then there's another wall, 
that's really the way to keep you know the stereo playing in your suite mate's room from getting through to your room so let me see if i can go even a little lower in frequency all of these tricks using masks get less and less effective as you go lower in frequency very hard to stop low frequency noise or sound from propagating. Yeah, you see the low frequencies are pretty darn hard to stop, even with this quite excellent barrier. But at high frequencies, it's actually, see this, this double layer wall, double mass layer, it really does an outstanding job at high frequency. Let me let you see a little more closely what I did here. So ideally I would have used absolutely identical stuff at both places, but I kind of put together what I had available. So this is 300 grams of stuff and there's another 300 grams of stuff just balancing it on the other side because this whole wave machine is uh, symmetrically balanced. And then this is 300 grams of stuff and another 300 grams of stuff over here. So this blob of stuff is the same mass as this blob of stuff, but Again, so here's my nearby room. Here's my far room. Like, like say, this is the space where I'm over here playing my stereo. This is the space where my sweet mate uh, doesn't want to hear my stereo. And then, see, here's one wall, here's another wall, and here's a, an air gap in between. And Again, that really does quite a good job. Oh, hey, that was pretty cool. That really does quite a good job at stopping the, uh, the sound wave from getting through from one side. You see, you can see a little bit of it gets through into that air gap, but then even less gets through to the other side of the wall. And at lower frequency, it's a little harder to stop. And at higher frequency, it's easier to stop. All right, cool. So you're gonna hear a beeper. It'll go wee, And then I'm gonna swing it back and forth over my head. And I'm gonna put the microphone over there. And as it's moving toward you, you'll hear a higher frequency. And as it's moving away from you, you'll hear a lower frequency. And the pendulum is a 25 centimeter long pendulum, so it has a one second period. And then Bill's gonna hit the pipe with a hammer. Okay, I'm gonna walk away. I'm gonna go about 86 meters away. Here I go. And you can see me. Hey, I'm 86 meters away. So let's see close up what you've been doing.
Here is an analogy for what we saw with the two speakers. Here's one speaker, here's the other speaker, and you can imagine a person walking back and forth in front of the two speakers, and here the sound is loud, here the sound is very quiet, here the sound is loud, here the sound is very quiet, and so on.